Hi, welcome everybody. So we're taping this today, just to let you know um, that that's what we're doing. Okay. All right. So go ahead, why don't you introduce yourself? Okay. So our plan, well, our plan for today is just to do some introductions, um, talk a, a little bit about sexual harassment, what it is, give you the overview of it, and then we're going to move into some um, case studies so we can practice and then what you can do if you get some disclosures of sexual harassment on campus. So first of all, my name is Corey. Um, I'm an instructor here at Leeward, and I teach sociology and women's studies. This is my fourth year here. Um, and prior to coming, going back to school and becoming a teacher, I did work at the Sex Abuse Treatment Center. So I do have some experience um, handling disclosures. And I did focus much more on sexual assault as opposed to sexual harassment, but that is still something that um, I was trained to deal with at, in that capacity. Hi, I'm Jane Bopp, and this is my second semester here. I'm a new instructor in sociology and in women's studies as well. Before coming here, I worked for five years on a department justice grant, Violence Against Women grant at UH Manoa, and I worked in the gender equity office there, which is where sexual harassment gets, uh, cases are taken care of, and then also in the women's center there, so that's where my background in this area comes from. So if you guys could just introduce yourselves to us and tell us a little bit about what role you are here. Okay. I'm Cindy Martin, Staff Development Coordinator, and I'm here because this is very important to do, and we would like to continue doing workshops like this for almost every faculty and staff. Mm -hmm. That's great. Hi. Hi, I'm Bernie Mack, and um, I am a PAR mentor for the Associates of Arts and Teaching program at the Word. Great. <laughs> I just changed my name, so it's hard to say the mute, like last name. Um, I'm a counselor for developmental math, and we see, counselor, uh, see students different students on an everyday basis, so we want to know their life. Great. I'm Sarah Gilbert. I'm in the Land and Life Department, and I just wanted to find out more information about you know, the board and the investigation and what you should do and what you wish to do. Great. Thank you. Well, welcome, everybody. Glad you're here. Okay, okay so. Team yeah, care. so Team Care, um, Jane and I are both members of Team Care, and the counselors probably have heard of this also, yeah, but for those of us who don't know, um, Team Care is an interdisciplinary group. We meet on campus twice a month, um, and we talk about all kinds of issues that are facing the campus. So um, we started out by just saying, well, what are some issues that are on campus that we want to address? How can we help um, faculty and staff respond to these issues? Um, and we really were designed to help the, the campus be safe a safer place and um, I'm glad that you brought that up but we did create these handbooks I'm not sure if everybody got one but this was a little manual that we put together last year um, and it had some really great tips about different issues facing the campus so there are some things that are not quite in there yet and hopefully they will make an appearance but um, things like sexual harassment domestic violence substance abuse PTSD etc so there are some um, resources here so if you didn't get one of these please go see Cami Kato I think she has some extra ones um, so that's us that's what team care does and this is part of a workshop series so again this is the first one of the semester so thank you everybody for being here I know that it's kind of a tight time yeah when we're all getting our feet under us so there you go oh I skipped around <laughs> team care handbook yeah okay so generally this is sexual harassment 101 so we're not going to get into the hardcore details, legal, the legal ease of it all. But generally, it's har harassment, the term for harassment is any kind of bothersome, demeaning, irritating, or annoying behavior. So that's what harassment is. Sexual harassment is specifically harassment that's sexual in nature. And so it's either based on a person's sexuality, sexual identity, or gender. And I'll go into that a little bit more. Specifically, sexual harassment is, first of all, it has to be unwanted. 
all right? So if I'm joking around with Corey and she doesn't mind it, I'm not sexually harassing her. So that part is very important. It's unwanted verbal, physical, or, or visual behaviors that are sexual in nature or based on gender. So I think some of us kind of have a feel for what's, what, what's sexual in nature, but based on gender also means that if I say things based on your gender, so let's say um, I, I, I make a comment that, you know, guys really shouldn't go into the social work program because men aren't as sensitive as women, right? Now that's not, it's not sexual in nature, but it is based on that person's sex. They're male gender, so that's discriminatory. So that's also considered sexual harassment. And what's also important is that it has, to, it has to either have the purpose or effect of interfering with somebody's ability to do their job, to achieve uh, academically, or to have access to all of the resources here that all of us have access to at the university. So if I feel uncomfortable because um, I hear people talking about sexual things that make me uncomfortable in the cafeteria, and so every day I avoid the cafeteria and I don't feel comfortable going there, um, I'm not having access to the cafeteria, which all of us should have access to. So that, that's, that's it, they may not have be intentionally, purposefully doing it, but it has the effect of that. And so there's you know, a whole list, a slew of things. But some of the things that sexual harassment can include are comments, jokes, teasing, puns of a sexual nature or based on gender, right? Um, dumb blonde jokes are usually based on a woman's gender, right? So, so that could be considered sexual harassment. Comments about clothing, personal behavior or body parts, requests for dates or sexual favors, Grunts, wolf whistles, cat calls, hoots, sucking noises, lip smacking, animal noises, staring, checking someone out. Uh, obscene phone calls, texts, or emails, right? Sexting is what they call uh, texting that now. Lies or rumors about a person's personal life or their sex life. Stalking someone. Sexual gestures, sexually suggestive looks or facial expressions. Right? Um, invading a person's body space, inappropriate touching of clothing, uninvited massaging, accidentally brushing up against someone um, or deliberately touching them, grabbing, kissing, hugging, patting, stroking, terms of endearment like honey, sweetie, babe, right? And then uh, posters, cartoons, drawings, screensavers, calendars, pictures of a sexual na nature or knickknacks or objects of a sexual nature, right? So even though this is my personal computer and it's at my, my cubby, if I have you know, a picture of a, a, a naked man or woman on it, right, and you see that, that could be considered um, sexual harassment and it makes you uncomfortable. Okay, so. That's you, right? Yeah, so we're actually uh, wanting to open up some discussion. So the, the list of things that we showed you, you probably have seen them or felt them or experienced them or you know something like that. But, but it's not always so cut and dry. You know, like you see the list and you're like, oh yeah, that's bad. That's not good. But what about how it plays out in real life? So we just wanted to, to ask you all what you thought. Is this welcome, unwelcome, or does it depend, right? So could it be considered sexual harassment if someone gives a lay Right? And then you pull the, the person in for a hug and a kiss. What do you think? Is that unwelcome, welcome behavior, or does it kind of depend? What do you think? I would think if you knew the person well enough for them to do that, to give you a lay and a hug, that they were comfortable enough with you, you probably already had a very nice, comfortable rapport with them. It would just be perfectly normal. It would be, so it's okay. It would be welcome. I think so, yeah. Sure. Anyone else? Other <laughs> thoughts or ideas? Oh, that's a, that's a good point when you're like, no, really, yeah. <laughs> right? Okay, good. Any other ideas or thoughts about this? Can you say a little more? Like, what do you mean? Um, that's a good point. Such as, like, if they're a work colleague or someone that you have, uh, you know, a good relationship with, or someone that you met straight off the street and you're you know, it could be unwarranted, meaning you give them the light, but they're not wanting it. Right. Or it's something that, oh, you know, it's a business party. Could I 
the right shoes to the lady. Yeah, it's okay. That can right. Be acceptable. So Good point. So the situation, it's kind of situational. Yeah, and then Cindy, you had a, a comment? Well, we had a guest speaker from another country. Ah. That's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Jay and I were talking about this and we were saying, you know, yeah, if you are comfortable enough to give someone and give them the hug and the kiss, then, you know, maybe it was welcome and hey, congratulations. But what if the person you're giving it and they're sort of retreating from you, right? You're like, no, 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 but I'm supposed to give you a hug and a kiss. They told, yeah. Cindy told me I had to give the guest speaker a lay, right? So, you know, it, it could be considered unwelcome. All right, I'm standing behind a coworker who's seated at a computer and, and you put your hands on their shoulder or you lean in, right? Because we all have our own desk. We're like, hey, come here, look at this. What do you think about my lesson, right? So you say, oh, well, let me take a look. Or you lean in real close on them. What do you think? Welcome, unwelcome, or depends. Who is it? How close are they? How long do they stay there? Depends. Yeah. It depends. What do we, anybody else? Are we like, everybody looks a little like udged out. Do we have this experience maybe? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it depends on just how, the duration of it, who the person is. Okay. It could be completely innocent. Some people are just more, you know, they're just touchy feely and warm. You know, right. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. 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 And people's the comfort level with um, closeness, etc. Good. That, those are all excellent points. Uh, what about making remarks about someone's body by email or text? What do we think about that? Welcome, unwelcome, or it depends. Why? Just because it's inappropriate. Okay. First of all, the person who you're talking about is probably not involved in that conversation. And so it possibly could be behind their back and they might not agree with it. Because um, earlier you had it stated that um, they have to give consent mm -hmm. um, for the remarks. And yeah. That would be wanted. Yeah. yeah. So it could be, right? Yeah. Perceived of as unwanted. Tiana, you. What did you think? I don't know. I, I, I think it, it really depends because, you know, um, I just was reminded of this uh, incident that I had the other week. It's just, um, I'm just this outside in a personal setting, but I'm just like, oh, you know, look at look at so and so. She lost a lot of weight. She looks really good. Like, mm -hmm. oh, she's really tall. Like, so there's no right. um, harm in being, you know, intended, but mm -hmm. it comes on to one's own body. Mm -hmm. It depends on how it is. Yeah. Yeah, we were just talking about that same example, right? What if you, you know, a coworker, you know that a coworker is working out and, and trying to look, you know, get healthy, and what if you comment? Is that, you know, unwelcome, welcome, or does it depend, right? Any other comments on that one? That one's kind of an interesting one. Um, and the last one is commenting on how great someone looks today. Can you explain that a little bit more? What do you mean? Um, it, it sounded, after I got to know him better, I realized it was just the way he was, but it sounded slimy and rude and lascivious, so. Mm -hmm. Good <laughs> morning. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right, whereas somebody else could say, hey, you look fine today, and you're like, thank you, right? Yeah. So I think part of, part of this is that it's, it's very much situational. You know, it really is. It really can be. And a lot of um, the difficulties with sexual harassment is that it has to be unwanted and the other person has to know that, right? So the best thing that we always say is that you have to feel comfortable in saying so, right? So if, if you're uncomfortable with this, you can figure out a way to say, hey, that, that really makes me a little bit uncomfortable, right? And, and that can then start us down the road of, okay, does this person then respect you enough to stop or does it continue, in which case you could bring up a sexual harassment suit, right? So that's, it's, it's tough. It can be a little muddy, but there it is. So welcome, unwelcome, or it depends. Oh, we have another one. Patting someone on the arm or the leg. This is another good one. 
Yeah. What do you think about patting someone on the arm? Or like, especially I see mostly faculty and people that work with students. Yeah, so those of us who are in positions of power or those of us who even have supervisors above us, what do we think about that, patting someone on the arm or the leg? When might it be okay? Good, yep, so very similar. Okay, so there are federal laws related to sexual harassment, and there's um, the t Title VII, that was the 1964 Civil Rights Act, so that pro prohibited sexual harassment in the workplace, right? And it makes certain employers responsible for preventing and stopping sexual harassment that occurs on the job. Now, Title IX, which came out later, that prohibits sex uh, discrimination in education. And initially, and some of you may have heard that related to sports. And that's what it had been used for, for for several decades because it was unequal. Men's sports had so much more money, so many more sports. They said, and they used this law to say that's unequal, which is why at UH Manoa, there are now the same number of female athletes as there are male athletes. And they have to have, right? So maybe the females don't play football. There's not female football, but there's female volleyball, female golf, female swimming, female everything. And then there has to be more women in certain sports to, to have it to be equal. Um, it's just recently, though, that this law has been extended to other forms of discrimination with respect to gender, because sexual harassment is very much gender-based. And so um, the recent lawsuits that have found by Supreme Court findings is that the school is responsible for student-on-student Right, so this has just been in the workplace, and usually it was uh, um, an employee with power over an employer over another person in the workplace. This has been put into education, so student to student or teacher to student harassment, um, especially when, as it said, the, and the language is that it's severe, it's pervasive, um, and it's so offensive that it clearly deprives the victim of access to, as I mentioned before, to educational opportunities or to the benefits that the university provides. So if I'm not comfortable using certain services, then that, that affects it. Um, also, in, that, in the case, the university has control over the context in which the harassment occurs. Right? So there may be some places that the university doesn't have control over that, but if they do, um, and that the university has control over the harasser, right? So students are subject to the student conduct code. In that way, the, the, student, the, the university has control over students on some level, right? Or employees, right? Um, and that they have knowledge of the harassment. Um, and, and, the, and, if they res and they responded with deliberate indifference. So I think, what weren't we just talking about the case over, what was the football coach? Sorry, I don't pay attention to spo sports. Joe Paterno. Right, so the whole Joe Paterno case. thing, right? They're saying, wow, whoa, you know, this, um, the, the university had knowledge of this and did deliberate indifference, right? Which is why this became such a big deal, why he lost his job, why all of this was happening, right? And they have the responsibility to respond, regardless of whether or not they had notice. The previous language said that the university had to have notice. They had to know that I was being harassed and then ignore me. But even if they don't have notice, um, if it took place um, within the university, it was severe and pervasive, the university had, has the responsibility of doing something about it. Okay. Now, the UH, uh, UH itself also has um, sexual harassment, um, and there's a system-wide sexual harassment policy. Um, so this defines sexual harassment as unwelcome sexual advances or requests for sexual favors or other physical or expressive behavior that's a sexual in nature, right, when the submission is either made explicitly or implicitly, right, so it's obvious or subtly made and, um, with respect to someone's employment or educational benefits or services. Um, submission or rejection to it is used as a basement for employment or for academic decisions affecting the individual. It has the purpose or effect again, um, and we'll talk a little bit about that, um, is intent versus um, 
what really happens. Purpose or effect of unreasonably interfering, interfering with an individual's professional or academic performance creates intimidating, hostile, or offensive educational or work environment. And that also, again, that it's sufficiently severe or pervasive as to alter the conditions of an individual's employment or create an abusive working environment. So that's what our policies uh, say. Maybe we should flip the light. No. Okay. We're going to flip the lights. Is, is sexual harassment really a problem? Like when I talk to people, they say, you know, sexual harassment, that's so 80s. Like, does this still happen? Right? <laughs> it definitely still happens. Now, this is a report in 2010 made by uh, the AAUW. And they asked uh, about 1,000 college students, over uh, almost 2,000 college students, if they had experienced sexual harassment or if they knew someone who had experienced sexual harassment. So if you look, almost two thirds or greater than two thirds of the students who were surveyed did experience form of, uh, some form of sexual harassment and also knew somebody. So it is quite pervasive on the college campuses. Um, and you can s just kind of take a look right here. Um, received sexual comments, jokes, gestures, and looks. Right, almost half were flashed or mooned, and that's what we meant when we said visual behaviors. So flashing, um, having things up on a screen, having pictures up, etc. That's kind of considered visual behaviors. Um, had someone brush up against them in a sexual way, were touched, grabbed, or pinched in a sexual way, and notice that some of these also cross over into sexual assault. Yeah, but we're also lumping them in sexual harassment here. Um, we're called gay, lesbian, or a homophobic names such as faggot, dyke, or queer. And again, that's whether or not they are in fact gay. Um, both straight, oftentimes straight men. This is the the most predominant way that straight men are sexually harassed is by having rumors spread about their sexuality. Uh, receive sexual pictures, photographs, web pages, illustrations, messages, and notes. Had sexual rumors spread about them. Had their clothing pulled. Uh, had someone block their way or corner them or followed in a sexual way, had sexual messages posted to them about them on the internet. Now this is one that we'll hopefully have, be having more uh, yeah. workshops on in the future, but this is becoming quite the problem, especially with Facebook and social networking. We're seeing a lot of this. And I think that some students don't quite realize that this is sexual harassment, right? Mm -hmm. when, when they have it happen to them and when they're doing it to other students. Um, we're forced to kiss someone, had their clothing pulled off or down, were asked to do something sexual in exchange for something in return. Um, we're forced to do something sexual other than kissing, and we're spied on as they dressed or showered at school, so as in a dorm. Um, now, they didn't break this down by gender, but they also, in the same report, had asked the students, what was your reaction to it? And what they found was really interesting was that women tended to re respond in a much more negative way than men did. So we really, any kind of sexual harassment, even though it just seems like, oh, well, they didn't really touch you or they didn't really rape you, um, women had a really, really adverse reaction to it. And we're, we're much more affected. Their schooling was affected. Oftentimes, they didn't want to go to the same places that this happened. They didn't want to go to their classes. They didn't want to talk to their professors. So the, the impact on women was found to be much greater. Not that it didn't affect men and that it doesn't affect men, but we also want to know that it really does impact women in quite a, an intense way when all of these things happen to them. And Corey made a good point. Um, sexual harassment. The spectrum, of course, could be from looks, you know, or me saying good morning, right, to sexual assault. So rape is on the extreme end of the spectrum with respect to sexual harassment and is included in that. And several of these things actually fall under um, the sex assault. Um, spying on someone mm -hmm. is, um, is, I believe, fourth degree sex assault. Um, flashing someone is uh, fifth degree sex okay. assault. So these also are coded as sex assault crimes, some of them uh, within Hawaii as well. Okay, okay. now, um, are you, is Betty? Yes. Right, so um, Betty, when you talked about touching students in class, you teach acting, but you let them know at the start of the class, right, that that's going to happen. It might be in the syllabus. And, and that's the thing. What happens on the university is that we're really proud of the fact that we have academic freedom. We get to say what we want. We get to think what we want, right? Um, people are, should feel comfortable speaking up. We should be able to have um, d different um, attitudes and opinions about different things and, and have that going on. And, um, and, and that's absolutely true, right? And the First Amendment rights, though, however, are, are the First Amendment freedom of speech, they're not boundless, okay? And so they shouldn't be seen as a defense against claims of sexual harassment. So if I want to make, you know, dumb blonde jokes about stupid women, right? Um, I don't get to claim, oh, but I have academic freedom in the classroom as a professor, right? I get to say whatever I want. They're not. It's not boundless, right? So behaviors that are in violation of federal or state anti-discrimination laws or the UH, 
policy, right? UH uh, student conduct code or um, UH sexual harassment policy are not legally protected forms of expression, right? Um, and especially too, since these classrooms, this is not a public setting, right? This is not a public forum out. This, the classroom and the university is here for a specific defined purpose. Right? And that the principles of academic freedom, freedom do not protect speech that is unrelated to the subject matter. Um, and so what's important is that if issues of sex, sexuality, or gender are related to the course, then to protect yourself from sexual harassment, you need to put that into your syllabus and you need to let the students know. You know, some literature classes um, talk about, you know, the literature of romance. That could be especially right, the literature of love. And so you could be reading a lot of, of, of literature that is extremely sexual and extremely graphic, right? And that could make a student say, this is making me uncomfortable, you're sexually harassing me. So if you're going to do that, those kinds of things, then if it's related to the subject matter, then you do get to talk about it, right? We don't get to censor that. And, but that should be reflected in the syllabus and talked about on the first day of class. And um, I teach women's studies. Even in my sociology classes, I talk a lot about sex and gender and sexuality. So I'm really clear in my syllabus that, I, and that I'm going to use graphic language, that I'm going to use graphic images. And I let the students know um, so that they can either, at that point, they can say, you know what, I'm going to drop this class. This class isn't for me. Or so that they've been warned that that's, that's going to happen and so that I can't be turned around right, and be accused of sexual harassment um, when I'm not technically sexually harassing. You know? So any questions about that? Because I know this a lot of instructors. And that's interesting what you say with the white teacher history. Mm -hmm. When we get to, of course, you know, Teresa Mullen, mm -hmm. we right. have questions. And I mean, I wouldn't expect any of my students at their age to have a problem with that. It, it tends to be more of a problem when they're in K through 8 or so. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But, you know, last uh, semester when we talked about Pompeii, mm -hmm. you know, there, there are some things that could be considered very mm -hmm. effective. Mm -hmm. From the bathhouses and right. yeah. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, I would say that I'm ahead of time here. I'm sure these are things, and I'd be mm -hmm. a little shocked, but mm -hmm. I'm happy to do a lot of things. Look at them in context in terms mm -hmm. of what the people yeah. at the time believed. And, right. Uh, feel free to send books about uh, I'm not, a, I'm not a pornography. Right. Or, you know, uh, some symbols that mm -hmm. might even make you feel shocked by. Mm -hmm. You weren't, you know, interpreted that mm -hmm. at the time. And there, right, and there's some, I mean, of course, if the whole class is going to be about that subject, that would be really difficult for the student. But there have been times when I've warned the students I'm going to talk about certain things in the class, and then I let them know if you, know, if you feel uncomfortable with it, we can try to come up with some sort of alternative, alternative mm -hmm. assignment or alternative arrangement if it's really going to traumatize you that much. Um, and I also encourage them, because a lot of times they're not going to talk to me. I'm the professor. I have power. They don't, they're not going to feel comfortable. I encourage them to talk to an administrator um, or an academic advisor. Um, and so, you know, and last semester I had two students actually do that. One talked to an academic advisor and one talked to the dean of students because they were upset about um, some of the things that I did or say. And, and so that was great, right? It was great that they, uh, they talked to the person um, and that they got their issues um, solved. Okay, this is another one. Um, the university actually allows consensual relationships. Now, some universities uh, on the continent do not allow uh, professors to date their students. They do not allow coaches to date their athletes. Mm -hmm. But here at the University of Hawaii, professors and faculty and staff may date students and one another, and coaches may date their athletes. Um, and so, so that, that, that can happen here. What it does say, right, is that by definition, it doesn't constitute sexual harassment, right? Because again, it's unwanted. If it's consensual, then we're agreeing it's wanted. So it's not sexual harassment. Um, but the problem with it is, is that a lot of these relationships have ended with sexual harassment cases. Um, because, because again, um, there is, there is often a power dynamic, and, and I, would, I would ask you, you know, um, let's say that um, I'm Corey's student and I'm dating Corey and it's love, 
right? We're in love. It's so consensual. We're in love. Um, and then I find out that Corey has been, I, I'm her student, that Corey has been cheating on me, and now I'm really upset. Well, it's midterms, and I'm wanting to break up with Corey, but I'm, she's, my, she's my professor, and it's midterms or it's finals week. Do you think that would be a really good time for me to break up with Corey? Probably not, right? Probably not. You know, um, or let's say uh, Corey and I are peers, and again, Corey and I are, are in love, we're dating, it's all good, and then um, as time goes on, I am turned out to be a scumbag, and then Corey breaks up with me, or whatever, um, and then five years from now, I am now the social science department chair, and I, get, I am her boss, right? How comfortable is she gonna feel now um, having me be her supervisor and something in the future if our relationship is kind of tenuous, right? So there's all of these unforeseen opportunities that actually make this extremely dangerous. So even though it's consensual, I would strongly encourage faculty and staff and coaches um, not to date their students. Anyhow, if, right, if this happens, um, if you've entered or, um, or you're about to enter into a romantic relationship with someone who is a subordinate, or who is likely to become a subordinate, right? So maybe I'm an instructor here, um, but I'm the only one who teaches a particular class, and that student is majoring in that, let's say I am an art teacher, and everyone has to take art XYZ, and I'm the only one who teaches art XYZ, eventually that student's gonna have to take my class, right? So who may become, then, then for you to protect yourself, you should make arrangements with someone else to not have any sort of supervisory or evaluative capacity over that person. So if Corey and I are dating um, and I am the department chair, then I need to let my boss know, right? I don't know, Mike Pexock or whoever to know. And, and so I need to recuse myself from any sort of evaluative, right, um, evaluation over her. Uh, or if I'm an instructor grading. You need to do that. Now, if you don't do that, what happens then is either nothing happens, right? Or if in the future, if sexual harassment charges do come forward and you didn't do that, the university is not gonna have your back with respect to protecting you from, from, from cases of sexual harassment. Uh, the union will, because they protect everyone, scum or not. Okay, that side comment, edit, no. Um, but, but the university will not have your back, okay? Um, and let's say Corey and I are in love and no sexual harassment ever comes and we stay together and we live happily ever after, right? That's still, how, what kind of appearance is that gonna have that Corey and I are dating in the department, right? And I'm the department chair. How are the other members gonna feel? Are they gonna feel like that they're gonna be <coughs> treated as equally or as fair as Corey or another student, right? If I'm dating one of the students on campus, are the st other students in that class gonna feel that they're gonna be treated fairly? I mean, that in itself can, can cause problems with respect to trust and respect. So that's really problematic as well, even if nothing ever comes, it's not sexual harassment and our relationship is fine. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's just dangerous business, people. <laughs> Okay, just business. It is. Okay. Is this you or me? Uh, well, I can go for it. All okay. right, so types of sexual harassment. We've already sort of alluded to some of them, um, and I can't get this out of my head. Jane, when we were putting this together, she said she always quotes um, Silence of the Lambs. Hello, Clarice. Clarice. Do you guys remember that movie? Apparently there was some line in there about quid pro quo Clarice. So that's what I think of now. But quid pro quo, we've probably all heard that term before, and it really means this for that. And so that's the cases of if you do this for me, something sexual, then I will do this for you. Promotions, the grade that you need, that little extra credit that you needed to pass. Right? So anytime that you're kind of using sex or sexual behaviors to sort of barter, right, to get something, then that w would be considered quid pro quo, okay? So I'll just read what it says here. In this type of sexual harassment, submission to the conduct is made a term or condition, either explicitly or implicitly, of obtaining education or employment. And I'm just reading this because this is right from our, our school's policy, right? This is the language that the policy uses. Um, or submission or rejection of the conduct is used as a factor in decisions affecting that person's education or employment. So essentially, if you say, hey, thanks, but no thanks, and then you didn't get that promotion, right? Or you didn't get that grade that you wanted. So a quid pro quo. This is sort of the scary one. This is the very uh, explicit one. This is the, t the one that we see in the movies a lot. Yeah. And this so. one is probably pretty easy to prove in a lot of ways, right? It's like 
okay, do this or not. But yeah, a little bit less uh, easy to prove is the hostile work environment or hostile educational environment. Um, and this occurs when an individual is subjected to unwelcome, repeated sexual comments, innuendos, visually offensive material or touching, which alters or interferes with school or employment performance or access to opportunities. So again, like Jane mentioned earlier, that if you're avoiding the cafeteria or if somebody has something like really uh, kind of provocative art in their office and you feel really uncomfortable going in there with them, right? That could be considered a hostile work environment. Or people are always like making comments about you or your body and you don't want to interact with them. That could be considered a hostile work environment. Um, the conduct has either the purpose or effect of interfering with a person's education or employment. The conduct creates an intimidating, hostile, or offensive, right? And that's the, the tough one to prove. It can be hostile, but when is it just offensive, right? Um, educational work environment. And this form of harassment doesn't have to involve a grade, right? It, you don't have to show, I didn't get this because I didn't do this. It's simply something made you so uncomfortable at your workplace that you didn't want to be there anymore, that you didn't like being there. Yeah, they can't see it, but uh. this is my example. Um, the I love boobs, right? So this is a breast cancer awareness campaign. And, um, and on this day, you know, um, lots of people, including lots of men, wear I love boobs t-shirts, right? Well, I have walked into a room where there's a whole four rows of guys sitting in the front with I love boobs t-shirts on. That, it makes me uncomfortable, you know? Um, or if a young woman wants to come in and sit down, is she gonna sit down to, you know? Um, and even though it's say, well, oh, it's really cute and it's for, you know, breast cancer, it's for a good cause, um, you know, my concern is that, if it said I love my boobs, that would be okay, you know, because I'm owning the statement men probably wouldn't wear it. And I always ask, well, men, for Testicular Cancer Awareness Week, would you wear t-shirts that say, I love nuts, right? Or I love balls, or I love testicles, you know? And they would go, oh, no, right? So again, there's some kind of weird gender thing going on there. There's some kind of homophobic. There's some kind of, right? It's very subtle, but I would argue that this, that, that somebody could say that this is sexual harassment if they have to go into a workplace or an office and this is going on, right? Even though it looks kind of harmless or it's for a good cause. I just wanted to ask, is, is, is anybody have any questions or any examples of this or heard anything on campus? It doesn't apply to regular harassment. Now, the university does have hostile workplace um, uh, policy, right? So if it's a hostile workplace, you know, if I'm if I give you stink eye, if I'm yelling or whatever, so that's separate. This one is specifically it's sexual in nature, yeah. So there there is a, a workplace violence or um, policy. This one is different. Depends, right? So, right, and, and that's the thing too with sexual harassment is that, and we're gonna get to that, is that um, first of all, yeah, it has to have the purpose or effect of making certain people feel uncomfortable, right? It's sexual in nature, which you could argue if the men aren't feeling comfortable with menstruation. But the thing is, is that people who are sexually harassing are not expected to be mind readers, right? So if you don't know, right, and they don't tell anyone, then there's no, there's no corrective action can be taken. There's well, nothing if, that we can be done. That this conversation makes me uncomfortable, then right, right. Yeah. then, and if they said, you know what, this is making me uncomfortable, and then, you know, everybody just kind of laughed and said, yeah, men can't handle, you know, blood or whatever, and moved on, then that, then he certainly would have cause for to a sexual harassment case, right? Because you knew and you dismissed it. Yeah. That's not to say you can't speak about it in right, the class, right? Because right? you could, like you said earlier, say, hey, we're going to talk about this today. You can step outside and come back or, you know, whatever it is. We can make accommodations. And that's okay. what we're moving into. So, right. Um, so other things, again, because this is really, it's very legal, right? It's based on these federal laws. And so one, uh, 
Um, one of the things is that it has to be something that a, what a reasonable person would consider to be sexual harassment. And so there's this idea of a reasonable person standard. Um, because again, as we were saying, we were talking earlier about culture. You were talking about Latin culture. You know, we were talking about um, giving a lay in other cultures. It means you're married here. It's the way that we greet people, right? So since people interpret things differently based on their gender, right? A, a man may not interpret something that to be sexually um, sexually provocative that a woman may. Um, also, on their ethnicity, there's age, right? Age differences, class. Um, experiences all of these things. Because of that, um, this idea of a reasonable person arose, right, that it was, that the behaviors, um, what would, what a reasonable person would consider to be sexual harassment, okay? So for it to be illegal, the conduct must be so severe and pervasive and offensive to a reasonable person in similar circumstances, right? So we do, we have some people who have mental health issues who are mentally ill. They may not be reasonable, right? Um, but again, you know, somebody would have to ask in your case, Betty, you know, would a man, a, a, a student, a person, a student of this age in this setting, could, would, would it be reasonable for him to feel uncomfortable in this kind of situation? If a, people would say, yeah, you know, I think that, that, you know, many men in this situation of that age and that status would feel uncomfortable. And I think that it's reasonable for him to say that that. Right. And again, this is all stuff that has to be determined legally, right, and in a court of law. But that's what the reasonable is. Because a lot of times people just blow it off. Oh, she's just, she's just being unreasonable. Oh, he's just unreasonable, right? You know, and then they, that's how they get to dismiss and say, oh, they're overreacting, right? A lot of times um, people just dismiss so another person's discomfort by saying they're overreacting, right? Okay. This is me, I think. All right, so there's also another aspect to sexual harassment, and this one is often, it's interesting that this one is often easier to prove than the cases of sexual harassment itself. And that's this idea of retaliation. So if Corey does go and report and complain, goes to you know Mike Wong and says that I'm sexually harassing her and I'm her department chair, um, and then all of a sudden, maybe it hasn't been proven that I sexually harassed her or not, that's irrelevant. But all of a sudden, I start to retaliate. I treat her differently. Um, she doesn't get you know, promotion in tenure. She doesn't, um, all, I don't uh, you know, approve her vacation. Um, I don't give her the classes. I start changing her schedule and giving her a really horrible schedule, right? One could, could say that that was retaliation, right? So, so that or threats of it, right, after they've complained about harassment um, is illegal. And again, that, um, that can, can result in liability. Um, and this is once the allegation of potential sexual harassment is raised, all persons who have knowledge of the issue are on notice. And that the university is responsible for ensuring that a proper investigation is uh, undertaken. And that was part of the issue with the Paterno thing, is that, well, he was on notice, but it didn't appear that a proper investigation was taken, right? And any action against the employee that has the effect of discouraging them or others from filing complaints constitutes retaliation, right? So if all of a sudden now people see how Corey's being mistreated, right, that's going to scare all you guys now, right? You're going to be like, oh, I remember what happened to Corey when she did that. I'm just, you know, I'm just going to let this slide. You know, I'm just going to just, you know, just put up with it for a while. I can handle it. Yeah, so that, that has a negative um, result that's more widespread than the two people involved. And about one third of all cases brought against employers claim retaliation. And those ones, like I said, are often easier to prove, right? Because she can prove what her course schedule was like and, and how things were before this event happened. And now we can see what it's like afterwards, OK? And they don't, again, the, uh, the original claim of discrimination doesn't have to be proven true or false, right? It's this, the uh, retaliation. OK. So, okay. Is this your, what do you think? Okay, so this is again, do you think that this is a petty slight retaliation or depends in these situations, right? So a supervisor professor has had a sexual harassment claim against him or her. How would a reasonable person, right, classify the following behaviors? So the supervisor refuses to acknowledge the, the employee when they pass in the hallway. Petty slight. Supervisor, with little or no explanation, denies the employee's first, second, and third choice of vacation week. 
<laughs> yeah, retaliation, okay. Department chair does not sign the birthday card for the employee when it has been circulated and left in the conference room before cake was served. Petty slight, right. Professor does not respond to a student's email request for an explanation of assignments. Retaliation, depends. Right, there are lots of professors who never answer their emails, it's true. Right, so, and again, I think even some of these could depend, right, because again, it's like, you know, did, the, did, did they always ignore me, right, or were they always saying hi and really nice and now, like, are they vibing me out, like, you know, like you said, that's just a feeling that you get, right, um, or, you know, they always signed it, but they're not, this could be they weren't there, you know, so some of them you don't know either, right. So uh, I don't know which order it has. I'm just going to read the first one and then whoever's group, if you could respond it. So Steve is a good-natured student with many friends on campus. He has been heard loudly joking with his friends in the cafeteria, saying things like, you're so gay and don't be such a fag. In class, he makes similar comments, laughingly saying, that's so gay, during lectures. There are two openly gay students in the class. So who had this one? Okay, so is that sexual harassment? Why or why not? What kind? What do you guys think? Um, sure. I think it is um, sexual harassment, and I think it's creating a hostile environment for the students involved in the class. Okay. So um, maybe this student is just not aware that his comments are offensive to the other students, and so that would be something to bring up and discuss as a class as a whole. Okay. I actually had this happen last mm -hmm. semester mm -hmm. in my archery class where mm -hmm. we were talking about Leonardo da Vinci, who mm -hmm. is gay. Mm -hmm. Right, so this is based on someone's sexuality, right? And so that's why it does fall under sexual harassment. Okay, great. Next. Oh, sure, great. Yeah. Yes. Q I. Q I. Maybe they've added. Right. Same time. Probably same place. All right, you and your boss have always had a good relationship. Recently, your boss has been making comments about how good you look, asking you about your love life, and saying how lucky your partner is to have you. At first, you brush the comments off and dismiss them. As the comments continue, you grow increasingly uncomfortable and finally confide, it, confide in a colleague about how you feel. Eventually, you tell your boss that you are trying to focus on work and do not want to discuss your personal life in the office. Later that day at a staff meeting, your boss makes an off the hand or an off the cuff comment to the entire department about how sensitive you are. Okay. Oh, you got it. We said yes that it was it did constitute sexual harassment and that it falls into two categories. It could be retaliation, so he's making you uncomfortable if you're in the meeting, or it could be a hostile environment. Mm -hmm. Right. So he's talking about personal things, right? The somebody's body, remember that was how they look. And then also talking, uh, making references to your sex life or your love life. Oh, your partner is so, right? And then the person says, you know, look, I don't want to focus on my private life. I just want to focus on work. Now, they didn't come out and say, you're sexually harassing me. Stop it, right? But they have let the supervisor know that they're uncomfortable talking about this. And then later on, in front of everyone, the, the, the supervisor says this you know, comment, oh, Jane's so sensitive, right? So yeah, I think that's great. Uh, sexual harassment, retaliation, 
um, and sexual and a hostile work environment. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we have in class introductions. Krista, a student, tells the class that she works at Godiva Chocolates and gets a 50% discount off merchandise. Later in the semester, her professor comes to Krista and tells her that Valentine's or tells her that his 10th uh, wedding anniversary is on Valentine's Day and offers her enough extra credit to pass the course if she will let him use her discount. So who had that who one? Who had that one? Okay. <laughs> these, are, these are all based on real life uh, things, by the way. <laughs> okay, so um, we decided that it was the pen. Okay. And um, we said that um, because she kind of announced or advertised her, her discount in the beginning of class, we weren't sure if it was an unwanted, um, like if she was advertising it to get people to come and she was gonna offer her discount. So we weren't sure if it was unwanted or not. And then um, we wanted to, we weren't sure on what her reaction to his question was. So uh, is it sexual harassment? harassment? Yeah, that, so we said, no. We, I, I think yeah. we were a little, um, we, we said if it was sexual harassment, it would be quick pro quo. You know, okay. Like um, but we weren't okay. sure if it was sexual harassment because was there anything of sexual nature in there? Good question. So should we open did, what, did, what did we all think? Well, Let's he wants open to it buy up. the chocolates for his wife, right? Right. right. Not for her. So mm -hmm. right. presumably, there's not, it's not of a sexual nature. He may be taking advantage mm -hmm. of her. Yeah. Of course. Nature. He may be abusing his power right. as an instructor, right? right? Yeah. So this would not constitute sexual harassment. Right. right. Yeah. It is a quid pro quo, <laughs> right? <laughs> Someone's abusing power. Yeah. Okay. But not sexual harassment. Yeah. Like okay. that, one. that was a good one, huh? <laughs> we tricked you. No. Okay. <laughs> On the first day of classes, a women's studies take your pick. A women's studies instructor informs the four male students in her class that the course may be difficult for them as they may not be able to fully understand the concepts covered. She mentions that women tend to do better in this class because women are able to multitask. Throughout the semester, she jokingly excuses late homework and wrong answers by saying, "Oh, men are so clueless." And this is all related to men's delayed emotional maturity. What do we think? Who had that one? Okay. Yes. So it what, yeah, right, wrong, right. So it's sexual harassment because it's gender specific, right? And it's a hostile environment. This didn't really happen. No, this one is not. No, um, <laughs> this one hasn't happened here that I know of. But um, I have had students in when I taught at UH Manoa talk about certain um, women's studies professors who like really do pick on the men. Um, and the example that they give is that a student would say, would make a comment, uh, a male student would make a comment and then the teacher would just tell him, you know, argue with him and disagree and say that that's stupid. But then like, you know, 20 minutes later, a female student would say the exact same thing and then the instructor would say how brilliant she is. And I've heard that about one particular instructor more than once. So it could happen. Okay. One more, right? Or two more? Oh. Yes, I have the one that's not okay. with the fifth one. Oh. Uh, after internal and external human reproductive anatomy is covered in Bio 100, a female student who sits in the front of the class complains to the dean of students about being sexually harassed by the male lecturer. She reports that he looked at her more than once during the lecture and talk about private body parts down there. Her family is from China where they don't talk about these things and she's extremely upset. She feels that she cannot return to class after this humiliating experience. Who had that? Okay. We thought no, no, but possibly it, it would depend. Okay. Um, if she didn't say anything to him, um, then no. If she didn't, if she didn't say anything, just complained about it. Well, complaining to the dean of students is saying something. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, if he continued to to behave in that same way, but it sounds like he's just teaching the class. Right, so he's teaching a biology class where they're covering internal and external human anatomy, so he's talking about penises and vaginas, right? So that's part of the course content. Yeah, so I don't think that would be considered sexual harassment. Yeah. Um, right. Right. 
I mean, this one makes it hard because there, culturally, right, there are issues, um, and so we need to be attentive to, to, you know, attentive to that. And though, if she needs bio 100, right, if she wants to go into nursing or something, then eventually she needs to realize that this is part of the course. And, and this is where, when we talked about the syllabus, right, that that should be on the syllabus. That students should know, you know, and, and for that week that we'll be covering this, you know, to let them know that that's what we're going to be talking about. Um, and so um, she needs to find a way to, to manage her feelings with respect to that subject, right, since it is part of the course content, right? It's like if I'm going to go and take an art class and, you know, I have to draw human anatomy and we have nude models, but I can't look at a nude model, and, but that's part of the class, it's going to be kind of hard for me to succeed in, in that class, right? Well, I think we'll, we'll talk about this more when we talk about responding to someone, especially mm -hmm. for the counselors in the room, mm -hmm. because just because something's not sexual harassment mm -hmm. by definition right. doesn't mean that we don't want to give our students um, some supports in trying to deal with it, right? And just really mm -hmm. saying, I understand that you're uncomfortable with this. Um, and, and it becomes something a little bit different, right? Maybe not a sexual harassment case that the university has to respond to, but absolutely something that we can respond to kind of mm -hmm. as, our, as the faculty talking to our students. And um, this is one other key concept with respect to sexual harassment, and that's this idea of intent versus impact. Um, because it's important to understand that my intent in doing something is irrelevant when it comes to formal cases uh, of sexual harassment, right? So what matters is the impact. So uh, I don't, you know, I don't intend to offend you. I don't intend to sexually harass you. You know, I'm just making jokes. I don't intend to be racist. I don't intend to be homophobic, right? When I say, oh, that's so gay, I'm not trying, I'm not intending to, to make homophobic comments. You know, I love gays. Some of my best friends are gay, right? Um, so my intent, the intent is irrelevant. Um, what matters is the impact. So if it is sexual harassment, right, by the definition of sexual harassment, if a reasonable person, right, the reasonable person, um, category falls, then it's the impact of how it affects me. Um, and so that the impact is what's going to be judged on it. And um, so again, saying, oh, I was only joking, it was just a joke, I didn't mean anything by it, is not a valid excuse when it comes to sexual harassment. Now, a, a lot of times, you know, a lot of times in these cases is that people really didn't mean it, they didn't know, right? They, they and, and they don't want to. Maybe you know, me, me saying, oh, that's so gay or whatever. I'm not trying to be, I don't know. When the person is told, look, you know, this, uh, if the instructor says, look, you know what, this is hurting some students, it's really offensive, you know, then a lot of times that per person will just be like, oh, wow, I didn't know, I'm sorry, I'll stop. You know, there are times where people are just being clueless, and when they are joking, um, and then they stop, and then that's okay. You know, corrective action has been taken, problem is solved you know, for the most part. Um, but again, of saying, oh, they should just get over it, it's just a joke, they can't take a joke, you know, they're sensitive, it's not an excuse. So again, they look at the impact of how it affects someone. And that, by the way, is, is what uh, student kind of courts and hearings, this is the one that most students say when they're brought before panel and ask, well, why did you do this? This is the most common response. I was, it was just a joke, right. yeah. But so we always have to remember, it is the, it's not just the intent, right? It's what was the impact of that behavior. All righty, so. The important stuff. Yeah. Yeah, if someone comes to you and tells you that they've been sexually uh, harassed, especially on campus. Now, the other thing that, that I think we, we didn't mention is that sexual harassment, um, technically speaking, can only happen in the workplace or in school. So anything that happens outside, like in public, is just considered harassment by HPD, by Hawaii statutes. So it's not necessarily considered sexual harassment. So that's a whole different thing. Right, so somebody says, oh, I was on the, at the bus stop and these guys keep like leering at me. Right, whistling. Yeah, yeah. that's not necessarily considered sexual harassment. So when you call the cops, it'll be considered just like a harassment, a general harassment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sexual harassment. Remember we talked about the title sevens and nines, right? Those are on campus by, by your employer. Workplace. So because we're dealing with on campus, um, we can't unfortunately com pr promise them confidentiality, right? We are mandated to, to report any types of sexual harassment that we hear of, right? So if a student comes to you and says, I am being sexually harassed on campus, right, then we are mandated to, to report this. And it goes to um, the dean, 
right now, Chris Minaseri, or to HR, right, to Mike Wong, mm -hmm. if it's an employee, employer. And right now, those are the two avenues, right, if you hear about sexual harassment on campus. So unfortunately, we can't say, well, I'll, you know, just tell me. I'll, I'll help you out. You know, just tell me. I, I won't tell anybody. We can't promise that. So, you know, um, two ways that we've kind of been trained to, to get people to tell us their stories, you can say, listen, you can, um, I, I just need to let you know before you say anything that I have to, to report this to hire to my hires up. Um, you can tell me if you want and I can help you through this process or maybe you need to think about what you want to say. And so the student might, might choose to tell you or they might not to choose to tell you. And then you can offer them, you know, other services. The other way to do it. Well, there's just, first off, if somebody comes to you, if, I, if you're my, my colleague and I come to you and I say, oh, there's something that I want to tell you, but you have to promise not to tell anyone, right? If somebody starts off that way, you have to say, you know what, depending on what it is, if you're a, a, an employee of the university, you have to say, you know what, depending on what that is, I can't make that promise. You can't promise confidentiality with certain things, right? And so, but usually what a person wants to know is that you're going to help them. That you're gonna help them you know? Um, when I worked in the gender equity office where I absolutely would have to report something, usually what I said is, depending on what you tell me, I may not be able to keep your confidentiality. So if you would like to tell me um, a what if scenario, I'm happy to listen to that and let you know the what if options after that. So that was a way, because we want people to be able to disclose. We want people to be able to share, to get some sort of support, right? Um, but we can't promise. And just for you to know, um, with respect to sexual harassment and the university being responsible, and I don't think I put this anywhere on the PowerPoints, but um, the higher you are on the university food chain, the more responsibility you have with respect to this. So if you're a student, you don't have any power. I mean, even as a mentor, maybe teeny, you know, but you don't have any power. So if I disclose something to you, if I say Professor so-and-so touched me, and you're my mentor, um, then it's your job to, to then go and tell, are you, who, who do you report to? Lexer or? No. no. Oh. Martel. Bobby. Uh, yeah. Okay, to Bobby Martel. Right. Then it's, Aaron yeah, Luke. so then you would then go and say, Aaron, look, um, one of these students told me this, and I'm really worried about them, and this is what's happening. And then after that, you're not responsible. So when those lawsuits come back saying the university did nothing or whatever, you're not going to get sued because you don't have any power. Right? So again, faculty you know, are higher than students, but they're not as high as a dean, right? Or the chancellor. Yeah, so just know that your level on the food chain, the, the more important you are, the higher. Department chair over faculty, right? Tenured over non-tenured. The higher you are, the more responsibility you have and potential liability in a situation um, with respect to this if you, if you found out. So you need to tell somebody higher than you about it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, sorry. Okay. Yes. Mike Wong, HR, yeah. Yeah. So right now, if it's a student-to-student -student issue, or uh, I believe even if it's an instructor to a student, right, it can go to Dean of Students, and that's Chris Menaceri. And if it's an HR issue, like with a supervisor, your supervisor, you're an employee of WeWork, then it would go to Mike Wong, yeah. So when we're talking, as Corey's going over this, I'm passing out to you the four pages from the Team Care Handbook that talk about sexual harassment. And there's nice little flow charts in there. So you can also refer to this. Okay. So I think that um, having worked in, in sexual assault and dealing with survivors of sexual assault, this is, all falls in sort of the same category. And I think that a lot of times with the sexual harassment stuff, we tend to revert right back to the legalese of what I can and can't do and what the bounds of the university are. And we kind of forget that there's actually a victim sitting in front of us and that there's somebody who's seeking help and that they were brave enough to come to us and tell us what happened. Um, there's a lot of shame in this stuff and it takes a lot of courage to come forward and to, to be able to say these things. So the first thing that we would always say is to thank them for coming to you and just acknowledging how much effort it took for them to come and seek you. Um, you thank them for trusting you. Yeah. Um, and try to make them feel as comfortable as possible. Um, you want to remain as calm and sensitive as you can. Um, and, and if you're going to share this information with colleagues sometimes, and, and even your partners, oftentimes um, we say that, that you feel like you get really indignant for that person. You get like, oh my god, I am just going to get really mad at that person for you. 
right? Mm -hmm. But it, that doesn't necessarily help the person that's sitting before you, right? Because then they feel like, oh, no, 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 don't, I don't want you to get mad. And they have to start taking care of your feelings, too. So the more calm, the more sensitive that you can remain, the less uh, burden you're going to put back on the person that's sitting in front of you, right? So you do want to remain calm and sensitive. Um, and don't judge. It's not your job to determine fault, blame, or innocence. Right, so this person, you, you don't have to be the tribunal. Uh, so we, we just say, hey, tell me what happened, and then you can follow the flow chart and figure out the best way for them to get help. And I want to point out that this doesn't matter whether it's the person who says that they've experienced sexual harassment or of I'm being accused of sexual harassment. This is, you're going to respond the same way. So let's say um, I, you know, I go to Corey and I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, um, one of my students is getting really upset and is accusing me of sexual harassment. One of my male students in my women's studies class, because I'm talking about menstruation, and it's just really pissing me off, and I'm really upset, and I don't know what to do, and I don't have tenure, right? Now, Corey may be like, even if she thinks, oh, God, Jane, she's really bad. She is always doing that. I've heard so many students complain about her. Maybe Corey knows I'm a bad dog, right? But it doesn't matter. She's still going to thank me for trusting her. She's still going to remain calm and sensitive because it's not her job to determine. She's not the one who's going to determine whether or not I'm, I'm innocent or guilty or whatever, right? So this can work both ways. And depending on your position, you may have, right, as a department chair or as a peer mentor, you may have another male student saying, oh, so-and-so is accusing me of this or whatever. You know, you, either way, you may face either one of these, OK? Yeah. Um, the other thing is because we are uh, we have a mandate to report. One of the things that I found helpful is, you know, even if somebody knows that, you can still walk them through that process. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, so now I'm gonna have to report this, and here's what's gonna happen. Mm -hmm. You know, you can say, I can go with you, mm -hmm. right? If you want, I can go with you to, to meet with Chris. I can go with you to see a counselor and then meet Chris. I um, mean, just sort of walk them through the process of what's mm -hmm. gonna happen. You can follow that flow chart. Um, and really do your best to sort of ex escort them through to the next person, right? Instead of just pushing them this way or dumping them without mm -hmm. any um, sort of idea of what's going to happen next because there really is kind of a loss of power mm -hmm. when these things happen you feel like you're just so helpless mm -hmm. and so to just feel like you're out there on your own floundering is a really disempowering position so we want to make sure that we're allowing this person the, the most support mm -hmm. possible yeah and oftentimes it's by giving them information and by offering them someone to walk with and someone to be with yeah if you experience sexual mm -hmm. harassment can you guys see all these cartoons that Jane worked really hard to get <laughs> So she's turning down to this guy and she says, well, go and browse somewhere else, <gasps> right? So hopefully this isn't, you know, this hasn't happened to you. But um, if you experience sexual harassment, um, don't blame yourself or ignore the problem, right? It is real. It's a real thing. Oftentimes people who experience sexual harassment are constantly asking themselves, you know, I don't know, maybe it's me. Maybe I did do this. Maybe it wasn't, maybe I'm just imagining this, right? Yeah. I mean, maybe I did was looking way too good this morning. You yeah. know, whatever it is. <laughs> we all sort of, ask, and it's, it's, I'm sure it's happened to many of us in this room, mm -hmm. right? We do question ourselves. So you don't want to blame yourself, and you also don't want to ignore the problem. Um, often harassers take the lack of response, right, as permission to continue. So I, I always tell people, you don't have to say, like Jane said earlier, stop, this is sexual harassment, and I do not like it, yeah. right? <laughs> but you can say things like, hey, you know, I am just trying to focus on work here. I don't want to talk about those things. Or, you know, I, I like to keep my private life separate. So you can say things, right? You can say no in certain ways where you don't have to sound like, these words that are coming out of my mouth sound really crazy, right? So you often do want to make sure that you do say something. Um, talk to a friend or someone that you trust about what you're feeling, right? Obviously, that's a good place to start. Um, tell or write the person who's harass harassing you and tell them to stop. That's one of the most important ways to get the process started, right? Because like Jane said earlier, if the person doesn't know that what they're doing is offensive, then they don't have the opportunity to correct the behaviors. So we have to give that person the opportunity to, to stop. Okay, so you do have to let them know. And that's exactly what this says here, yeah? Um, if the harassment doesn't stop, then you do want to ask for help. But I would suggest asking for help along the way. Yeah, well, seek help. Yeah. Seek help along the way here, too. And if you're not uncomfortable, because maybe I'm not comfortable telling the person, stop, I'm scared, I'm uncomfortable, yeah. I'm shy, whatever, then ask somebody else. Then I, that's when I go and I let somebody else mm -hmm. know what's going on. And if I told Corey I'm really uncomfortable, my department chair is doing this, then she'd be like, well, you know, you should let Mike Wong know. And then he can address the issue, yeah. right? Yeah. So do seek help. 
as early as possible. And you know, that, that is talking to the friend someone you trust that's seeking help along these steps. Um, and the final one is to document the things that are going on. And I know it sounds kind of strange to do that, but if you compile a list of the dates and the times and what happened, it's a much better, um, you can fall back on this when you're showing people, here's what happened, right? And if there's a retaliation, if there needs to be a case mm -hmm. built, then you have all of this information. So you want to keep written dated records of your experiences, time, place, names, a short description of what happened. Mm -hmm. yeah, and, and I mean, I know it sounds weird and it's hard to remember, but again, if a student comes to me and tells me, oh, miss, you know, I really like you and I just want to tell you every time I go into the library, I'm really uncomfortable, you know, there's these guys in there and they do this stuff and I don't know what to do, right, then it's my job to say, wow, thanks for telling me, I'm really sorry this is happening, you know, um, I think that let's go, you know, you need to let somebody in student services know and then maybe Chris Manasseri can talk to whoever is the head librarian and work this out, right, and so then I need to make a note of that, that on, so and, on this date so and so came and talked to me and then I referred her to Chris Manasseri and, you know, walked or did not walk you know, her to Chris Manasseri. So that's the whole thing on the food chain thing. So that if it ever comes back, that she ends up suing the university and saying, well, I asked for help and nobody did anything, right? It's like, but I told my women's studies professor and the university didn't do anything, you know? Um, and certainly if you're being harassed, you need to keep, you know, the date that somebody said something, you know, what it was, how it was um, as evidence, yeah. Well, we remember we can't promise confidentiality. So it actually de depends on how severe and pervasive it is. If one time, you know, if you come and tell me, oh, my boss like looked at my boobs today when he was talking to me and that made me uncomfortable and I didn't know what to think, right? One time, um, you're not traumatized, you're planning on going to work, you're like whatever, then um, maybe, you know, I don't have to do anything. But if you said that, you know, he said that you had to have sex with him or he was going to um, fire you, right? Even if that was one time, that's pretty quid pro quo, that's pretty severe. Um, that's something that I would have to say, you know what, I'm really sorry, but I'm gonna have to let Mike Wong know um, I might try to protect your confidentiality and going to Mike and saying, Mike, look, somebody, my coworker told me that, you know, that the, 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 the chancellor said this to her, right? And then it's their job to do an investigation. And even if you refuse, even if the, the victim refuses to participate in the investigation, once the university is on notice with something like that, they have to follow through. Now, you may say, I'm not talking to you. I don't want to have anything to do with it. That's your choice. But the university is responsible for at least doing an investigation. Yeah. And one more quick question. Um, sometimes it happens that when you're teaching your class, mm -hmm. um, I've heard that oh, you notice some student uncomfortable, but mm -hmm. if nobody comes up to you, then mm -hmm. you notice something, you know, she keeps moving or he keeps mm -hmm. moving and somebody mm -hmm. bothering them. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. I mean, your responsibility, I would say, you know, the student does have the responsibility to come and tell the teacher, but I think it's great if you can remain vigilant mm -hmm. and notice and you can go, of course, talk to a student, mm -hmm. you know, and ask them if they could, I've had that, mm -hmm. you know, I've had students that looked uncomfortable in my classes and I just had to ask them, well, what do you think, what's going on, how are you doing? You know, opening mm -hmm. up that conversation and seeing what they say. Mm -hmm. um, or we have like the group of guys, you know, you guys get that? Like the group of guys that all sit together and then they like start chit chatting and, you know, making comments under their breath, you know, so it might be breaking that up and making the classroom more comfortable. So I just try to check in with students yeah. like after class or whatever. I just ask, oh, is everything okay? I mean, I've seen domestics happening on campus. Um, you know, where like, you know, the students are yelling or somebody looks and I just, I just yeah. go, I just say, hey, is everything okay? You know, I just like, cause well, I'm just, you know, I mean, but that's me, maybe other people in that situation. And what it says in the handbook is that if you see something like that going on, you know, outside, you call campus security and then they address it. But in the classroom, I just try to check in with the student, you know, and yeah, I'll just go and just stand my big old self right over, if somebody's acting up, I'll just stand over here and then lecture right in front of their face at the class, right, you know what I mean, just try to do other, yeah. other smaller things like that. But that's a, and 
it's about being attentive and aware and then feeling comfortable, right? And I think it's good, you know, for us to be vigilant as a campus, because I know that um, I had a student who said that there was a group of boys sitting in front of the library rating girls. Out, rating. Rating girls. girls. Not rating, scale. rating, yeah. yeah, and saying like, I, I'd do her, or I wouldn't do her. And the, the women students could hear that, and I never saw it myself, but we would bring this up, you know, and we could kind of just say, oh, I think there's this group of guys, and the security is really great. They'll mm -hmm. say, you know, if you tell them that there's some stuff happening, then they'll kind of like cruise the, mm -hmm. you know, cruise the area and just kind of create more of a presence, and mm -hmm. you know, so I think that as a campus, and they never heard anything either. This was all just kind of on the word of students mm -hmm. that this was happening, but we can definitely make our presence be known and just this is appropriate and this is not appropriate and keep our students safe in that aspect, mm -hmm. you know? I think, I think that's, that's it. it. Yeah. If there's any questions or comments. There's evals, so please fill those out and you can leave yeah. them here upside down. Um, any other questions or comments? Have you guys had students tell you this kind of stuff? Anybody yet? No? Disclosures?